Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, uh, thank you so much for being here tonight, and thank you for staying for the panel, and thanks to the Royal Court for, uh, host, for giving us this space to have this conversation. My name is William Gregory. I'm a, a, a translator. Uh, I was the lucky translator who translated the play that you've just seen. Um, oh, thank you. Um, and um, I uh, welcome to this uh, post-show talk, which has the um, preposterously ambitious title, for which I can only blame myself, Translation, Performance, Perception, Staging Latin America. <laughs> So that's a big subject, um, but I'm really delighted to welcome my four wonderful guests whose experiences and expertise will help us uh, scratch some way beyond the surface of that topic and I'm sure leave us with lots to think about and explore as we go off into the bar or into the night uh, after this. I'm going to not do it in the order that we're sitting because I've got it written down here. So I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Catherine Boyle, uh, Professor of Latin American Cultural Studies at King's College London, Director of the Out of the Wings uh, Latin American Theatre Collective, Director of the Centre for Language Acts and World Making, Co-Director of the Theatre Company Head for Heights. To Catherine's left. Almiro Andrade, who is a black queer Latinx actor, director, dramaturg, and theatre translator from Brazil, lecturer in contemporary acting at UAL, and an associate artist at Stone Crabs Theatre uh, and Foreign Affairs, and part of the Out of the Wings Collective as well. To Catherine's right, Mariana Aristizabal, a Colombian theatre maker, who wears different hats depending on the project, sometimes actor, director, translator, or facilitator, and I hasten to add assistant director of A Fight Against. <laughs> Quite right, too. She has a particular interest in collaborative work in exploring horizontal and non-hierarchical relations in the rehearsal space and exploring multilingualism and how these elements influence the way we relate on and off stage. She's co-director of the company at Mariana Melena Theatre, who's particularly interested in amplifying female and Latinx stories here in the UK. And to my left, Malu Ansaldo, international arts leader, programmer, producer, and consultant who has worked at so many uh, organizations here in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Recently uh, at Battersea Arts Centre, before that head of performing arts at the Roundhouse, also worked for Cirque du Soleil, National Theatre Wales. Uh, the list is just so long. Uh, and uh, also I have to say, um, uh, mention uh, the producer of the uh, Globe to Globe Hamlet World Tour and the Globe to Globe Festival in 2012, which brought I don't know how many companies from the world, around the world to 37. the UK. 37. Wow. Uh, so anyway. 36, one or three. Okay. <laughs> Please welcome my guests. So we're going to get into the meat of the topic, and I'm going to start uh, with you, Catherine, if I may. So um, you have a very extensive experience as a translator and researcher and a platformer and promoter of work by Latin American playwrights from Chile and elsewhere, um, and also as director of the Out of the Wings Collective, which uh, uh, occupies itself with, with doing exactly that work too. I'd be really interested to hear from you um, a, a bit of a panorama, I suppose, about in your experience of doing this kind of work. What are some of the key challenges that we face to bringing this work into the United Kingdom? And have you noticed any changes over that time? Thank you. Thanks all for being here. Thanks for the wonderful show tonight, the performance, the translation, the direction. It's really, really great to see this, this work on stage at the, the Royal Courts and see it here as, as new writing, which is what it's all about. It's, it's um, funny doing this question because in the audience there's a good few people and on stage a good few people have been working very hard in the promotion of Latin American theatre performance for a very long time. I think um, I'm the obvious academic and I think I've written down all my points so I can get them <laughs> quickly because I haven't got all that much time. Um, I, think, I think there's a number of things. I think 
The first thing I was thinking about is the context of UK theatre, the context of making theatre. Wherever it is, it's harsh and it's difficult. And, and, and you put Latin American theatre or any non-British theatre, to use that um, phrase, into that mix and it becomes even more difficult. So one of the things that's become very clear to me over these many years is that part of, of the issue is you're always vying for space. And one of the things that's changed is a real uh, developing interest in, in translated theatre. It's not massive yet, but it's, it's definitely growing in, uh, in international theatre, in different types of representation. And, and that's made it um, more exciting in so many different ways, but that space hasn't gotten all that much bigger in some ways, but I'm going to qualify that in a minute. I think... In that sense, the need for advocacy is, is, is constant and the need for voices to keep doing the work of, of translation and directing and, as you, those of you who know me will hear, uh, expect what I'm going to say next, creating spaces no matter what to be able to do um, the work. And I think one of the things that we need and I think one of the things we've been developing over um, well, I'm going to, the last 30 years is this, the, the need to understand what the space that we're in and the need to be sensitive to it and to the context. And that doesn't mean to sort of be subservient to it and to bow to it, but to be really sensitive to how we can um, engage with it and insert ourselves in it. And I think one of the things that's been really exciting over the last I always say five years, but I think it's something like that, five, six years, is that there are increasing radical proposals and radical attempts to, to, uh, to get these voices heard. And that's, that's by, I think, by a, through a sense of, um, of creating these spaces. I mean, you mentioned Mariana's work, Malou's work. There's, there's, I can't mention all the people in the audience who are here who are on stage tonight who have done that by creating their own uh, performance pieces, by creating their own companies, by occupying whatever space um, they can. So I think that's one of the changes that's, that's happening. It's, there's obviously places that are all courts and the major theatres are really important, but the route to them has, is becoming much more varied, I think. Um, and I'll stop there because I know we haven't got much time and we might come back to that. But just as a way of starting off, that's my first response, I think. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I think we may delve a little bit further into that later on. Um, bef before we do that, I'm, 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 I'm going to come to Almiro and ask, and ask a question uh, about process, about, a, a tran about processes of translation and pipelines of translation. So, so this play, for, for anyone who perhaps doesn't know, it's come out of a, a particular process here within the Royal Court of um, the Royal Court engaging with Pablo over a number of years, working on a brand new play, me as the translator coming in on that project quite early on and um, th that work being made throughout that new writing process. I think when we think about the translation of plays, that's fairly unusual outside of this space. Normally we think perhaps more of there's a play that already exists somewhere, it's maybe already been published in its original language, it's maybe had a production in its original language, and then at some point it comes into encounter with a translator and as if by magic it's then uh, on, on for, for four weeks in a London theatre. Almiro, uh, have I described that pipeline accurately? <laughs> or to put it another way, talk to us a little bit about process uh, in your experience as a, as a translator, particularly working with plays from Brazil. Well, thank you, William. Thank you, uh, Rachel, and thank you so much for all of you, cast, crew of The Fight Against. It's, you have no idea how you're making history and how important it is for you guys to be on stage, for us to hear your voices on stage, to see you on stage, to see ourselves in you on stage. So thank you, thank you so much. And uh, about the process, I think William described it so well that it, that it leaves me with very little to add. But uh, speaking of my own, um, process as well, the processes that I've been involved with, is that there are a plethora of companies here in the UK that engage with work from Latin America and that are championing uh, the translation of work from Latin America. 
Uh, we have works from foreign affairs theatre where uh, there's a foreign affairs translator. That is not a focus on Latin America, but they have work for Latin American uh, theatre practitioners. And seeing how those companies are bringing those works to stage, bringing those stories to stage, is so important because we need to understand that those stories speak to us regardless where they're from. Mm -hmm. They are our stories. If they're reaching the stage, it's because they're speaking to us and they have a message. And that is the beauty of the work of the translator sometimes. And thank you, William, for bringing this, this piece to us and making it available for us. Because sometimes there are so many stories that are being told elsewhere in the world that we think that we'll never have the possibility of reaching, uh, that the translator allows those stories to reach this stage. Uh, uh, one thing that I would plea, though, is for programmers to think that Latin American stories are not just for the Latin American audience. Don't think that you need to program a special festival for a Latin American community just to see a Latin American show hit the stage. Don't wait for a Latin American play to come to stage to, ha to cast a full Latin American cast. We are part of the community. Being Latin American is just one part of our identity. We are actors, we are performers, we are writers, we are makers, and we are part of the UK landscape already. So treat us like that. Thanks, Almiro. I think we might get onto programming a bit later on. We've got a, program, we've got a programmer on the panel. But um, you mentioned there um, the, um, the, import, the, the importance of, uh, I guess, to shorthand it, visibility, representation in terms of who's on stage. And of course, here uh, with the fight against, we have, I think, a first for the Royal Court, which is a fully uh, Latin American, Latinx. Uh, cast and in addition uh, lots of great Latin American creatives involved uh, uh, behind the scenes with with this project um, Mariana I'll come to you as assistant director on this play can can you talk a little bit about um, with the work on this play what what impact did it have that we had a you know not just one Latin American artist but a critical mass of yeah. Latin American Latinx uh, colleagues working on this play. What was the impact of that on the yeah. work? So I think it, it worked in, in various kind of levels. So one is the personal level. So I think it was quite interesting to be in a rehearsal space where all the actors, and, and this is just me speaking from my experience, um, also as a creator, were not othered. So that was quite nice to feel that everyone felt recognised in someone else and for the first time in, uh, in, in the sh this making of a show, they were not the other, the one that, ne that is kind of like the ticking box, which was quite interesting. Uh, additionally, I find that the spaces in which we were not necessarily working on the play were quite fluid in between English and Spanish. So it was quite nice that we were able to inhabit a space of being the two selves, no? Because I think when we're speaking both in, like, in English, we definitely have a personality or there's traits of us that become stronger and then the other one is, is a different thing so it was quite nice to have the two kind of like coexisting and I think our bodies were also very different we allowed ourselves to kind of like be more like I want to say yeah more touchy I find that at least this cast no everyone is knows each other and we we allowed ourselves to kind of like relax and in that sense I think it's quite interesting because it achieves the purpose of the play of creating communities without necessarily not making that a goal. I was thinking that today and then if you think about uh, the professional or like what it meant for the play I think is quite interesting to have the two perspectives of a text because whether the words are like the same or like the equivalent in English than in Spanish you might have a completely different understanding of that word in one language and in the other. So I think having actors that can have both lived experiences, but also like two imaginaries of the same thing enriches the play so much. And in that sense, I believe this play achieves so many things because it has that, the lived experience of these people that have also 
no, not necessarily those specific particular places, maybe not all the actors were in Chile, not all the actors were in Peru, not all the actors were in Mexico, but they, there is a common understanding of a place, of, how, of a perception of the world. So I think that makes the place stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I think, yeah. Thank you, Mariana. <laughs> We had a great debate about what the word chocolate actually means. Oh, didn't yeah. Didn't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's for true, later. True. Um, thank you so much. No. Um, Malu, I think, um, again, thinking about this idea of um, Latin American artists who are based here in the UK, making work here in the UK, yeah. is, this, is, is this part of us needing to perhaps expand what we define as international work? So we yeah. think, when we think about translation as a sort of a binary, you know, from there yeah. to here but it's more complicated than that maybe. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, yes, I've, I do think about this quite a lot mm. also because like, you know, who are we to say, oh yeah, this is, this is theater and this is international theater, like as if the whole world is the same, as if like people would feel stories, tell stories or, or experiences in the same way, you know. Um, if we look at theater only, there's different theater styles. We make theater in different ways in different countries. Um, and so, you know, I wish in a, in a dream world, we would just call it theater, mm. you know, mm. and that's it, because otherwise we would have to put a label on every country and even in each country, the realities of the different regions. I worked in different parts of Argentina and the theater makers are very different there in the diff it's such a big country. And so, um, yeah, I find it a bit hard. I still, you know, it, it's kind of complicated also because as a programmer you're always thinking beyond whatever I would personally want to put on stage when I work for an organization and I'm programming. I need to sell tickets, so who are those audiences? And like what Almiro was saying is very true. You know, we can't always just focusing on Latin America, right? Uh, just, you know, oh, we can only program this if it's within an international season or, or we have to have a festival or it's only going to be targeted at those audiences that either care about Latin America or are from there or speak Spanish or uh, Portuguese. Like maybe they're just shows and this is the same thing that we think about creatives who are here. Yes, we are all coming from Latin America and we have those lived experiences, but we're also practitioners and we're part of the creative industry and the creative economy. So we work, we pay taxes, we're like anyone else. So why can we only do things that are these kinds of stories or just put in this box. Um, this is amazing because it is a whole cast and it really is saying something. It is saying that, you know, it's not just this story, it's any story. These people can be on stage on a show, not necessarily because it's a Latin American show or because it's this story, but because they're great creatives and they can be in the, on this stage and they can be in this theater. And I wish like that every time there is someone Latin American working somewhere in any theater in the UK or anywhere else in the world. We don't have to celebrate as an accomplishment, but we would just feel it's our right because it is, right? So, um, I don't know. I hope we stop calling it international theater and we just say theater. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Malu. Um, I'm going to extend that idea as well to um, question about audiences as well. I'm going to come to you, Catherine, and bring us back perhaps a little bit to thinking about translation. Uh, we, we talk, we're, we're here in, um, we're in, a, we're in a, a, a globalized world. Audiences are also international and multilingual, especially in a city like London, but elsewhere in the United Kingdom as well. Um, uh, last year, the, um, the literary uh, translation community started thinking about this idea of what is the mythical English language reader. We might think about who are the mythical English language audience. Yeah. Catherine, as a translator, um, how, how, when you're rendering a play into English, do you consider the fact that there is no one British English sitting in the audience expecting, you know, to whom we can match our translations? I, it's something I've lived with all my life I mean <laughs> I, you know and and you know growing I've told this story before but it's really important as a, just a way into this growing up in in Scotland and um, and constantly having Scottish B 
beaten out of you sometimes physically, you know, you, that, that sense of there not being one English is, has been there constantly, uh, you know, being told at certain points to, to get rid of your accent. So, that, so it's, it's constantly there. I think one of the things that's been really interesting, and this goes back to the ways that things have been changing, is that I think the orthodoxy of translating um, into your own language is beginning to be challenged and it's particularly this type of community that's challenging it and I think you know to name out of the wings we've seen that with out of the wings readings that we do every every month we're increasingly we're getting people who are translating uh, you know from Spanish or Portuguese into English like Al Almiro here you know and 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 creating a community where that is uh, welcomed and and um, and honoured as as a real way of translation because as we all know that the orthodoxy is you translate into your own English because your own language because that's the language you command, and that will make uh, a piece of of literature of text or whatever that can be read as if it had been written in that original um, in that in that language, um, which which takes you into. Problem, uh, to questions of seeability, performability, talkability, all these uh, illities <laughs> that come up in, in translation. You know, a, a failed translation can be, has been seen sometimes and, and very often and in that sort of uh, orthodox space as something that cannot, that couldn't have been written in the first, in the translate, in the target language in the first place you know and if you read some lazy um and they always are very lazy those sort of lazy uh, comments when somebody's translated a 300 page novel and somebody in in a newspaper says you know it didn't quite work you know or something you know and you think it's these these sorts of things i think we're not going to get rid of them immediately but i think they're they're changing and the reason they're changing is particularly because the types of communities that that we are creating in in london which um which where English is lived as a multilingual language. Mm. And I think we're beginning to recognize that more and more. Um, and I think that's, that's, um, that's wonderful. And I think that's that idea of voice in translation is changing. Voice in translation would have been thought of in a sort of theoretical way as syntax and, and lexis and the, the sort of grammar, the, the language, how you use it. But, but I think there's a much more important and much more um, visceral sense of voice coming uh, coming to the fore, mm. and I think that's important. What a voice is when when English is spoken, well, in all the different dialects and voices that ex exist in the UK in the first place, which have been repressed for a long, long time and had been repressed for a long, long time, um, and then you put into that mix all the different Englishes that are being mediated through the hundreds of languages that are spoken in, in, the, in London, for example. And I think that's, that's making a difference. And I, and, you know, and I think in the long, you know, when you've been working in translation whatever for a long time, I, I know that my, my view has changed massively, you know, over, a, I can't mention these 30 years, because it's, you know, when I started translating and, and that was your sort of, standard and I and and it has changed my my view of that and it's changed because of the people we work with and because of the way that the English is is changing and I think that's that's pretty wonderful I'm not it's not um, all rosy by any manner of means but I think that changes so in terms of thinking about um, the audience I think of it you know to, to to think of this play actually much more of a sense of what how you engage communities in that uh, in that celebration of English as a multi multilingual language rather than what I do as a translator because I'll trans you know because that's a that's a different sort of thing but if you're working in a in a group translating in um, in that way then I think you can embrace and and be part of, of changing the language and the last thing I'll say that is that translation has always played a role in changing language and changing the canon. And I think that's a, that's a role that we've got to keep embracing and making uh, making part of our work here. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Almira, I'm gonna to come to you now and sort of flip the question on its head. So Catherine's talked about the myriad Englishes that there are. Obviously, as a translator translating from Portuguese, there are 
just as many Portuguese is. Every playwright will write in their own style. They will have their own voice. You, as a translator, faced with rendering that particularity of a playwright into English, how, how, do, you, how do you tackle that? How do we avoid getting things, yes, I'm going to say it, lost in translation? <laughs> <laughs> I think it has a lot to do... That, that's a tough one. <laughs> William, thank you. But I think it has a lot to do with what Catherine just said. I think we... I might be stealing from a book that I've been reading lately, <laughs> but uh, I think we're sort of all... We need to understand ourselves as migratory birds. We're all migrating. We're all... We don't have an identity just because of a place. We are who we are regardless. I don't stop being Latinx because I'm black. I don't stop being black because I'm queer. Uh, and I'm both Brazilian and British, and those identities have to live with me. So I think the things that get lost in translation are probably the things that we don't translate, mm -hmm. that we, mm. we fear translating. And I, I dread that, I really dread that. I, I, if you have a passion project I see lovely translators there at the back as well, and as many of you that wish to translate plays from the plethora of languages that we can think of, do it. Do it, because if you have a story to tell and you want to tell them, it needs to be told. It needs to reach people. So if you have that little bug inside you telling you, do it, do it. It's important. It can change someone's life. Thank you, Almira. Do you know what? I'd never thought of that. The things getting lost in translation, the worst ones are the ones that don't get translated in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> That's a universal answer to that question in future. Thank you. <laughs> um, Mariana, um, I'm, I'm going to come to you now. Um, again, we've, we've t and I'm going to come to this question, one part of the title, which is perception. Yeah. Shift the conversation a little bit now, thinking about uh, the experience of being a Latinx theatre artist uh, in the UK, and I know some of your work has actually directly addressed this. Talk to us a little bit about the, the challenges of facing perception of, be it of audiences, of colleagues, of the industry as a whole, and how perhaps some of your work has addressed that. Yes, uh, oof, that's, that's a tough one, no? and because I think it comes from, again, two, two perspectives. Um, one is what the system imposed onto us as humans, whether whatever we come from, no, the, the set of beliefs that people have about a particular group, ethnicity, no, uh, location. So like, um, how are we believed to speak, to look, to behave, to sound, to act, no? So those are kind of a certain set of beliefs that are there in which when we migrate, when we come to a different place, uh, we encounter. And then I guess there's, there's the other issue, which is that the one that I think a lot of, I think most of migrants um, face um, when going to a different country is trying to be the good migrant, no? Yeah. So trying to either respond to those kind of like set of canons that are put there to you to kind of like fit, or in a way to yeah, show your value and, and prove that you be, that you are worthy of not not what Malou was saying like we should not be constantly proving that we belong we have the space no so I think having those two are is, is, is difficult because you need to navigate those things and so like in in my work uh, most recently uh, for example uh, one of our shows is uh, playing Latinx uh, so it's a show that started uh, with some casting calls for Latin American uh, male characters, uh, which were wild descriptions about what a Latin American male uh, is. So it's a sex bomb that has sex for breakfast, that kind of thing that you think like, okay, <laughs> how? I, I, I don't know why, but hey, it exists and people apply. <laughs> No, and people get casted for that, and there is a role of that somewhere in the universe, which you think, how detrimental is this? Mm. 
So uh, based on that, we collected a couple of those and we created a show to um, show the audiences how to be a successful Latin American. Uh, just to, no? Kind of like play it back. And then uh, another show that we did, the two of us, is also about um, challenging the, per the perception of what a woman is or should be, both like in, in her space as a migrant, let's say, so being abroad and then going back home and what are the different expectations that she needs to kind of like face and how to work around that. But I think it's, it's difficult mm -hmm. and it's challenging and it's also sometimes tiring because it feels that you kind of like need to stand up, no? for everyone, so all the oppressions, you need to stand up and be like, no, this is me and these are the stories that I need to tell. And sometimes you just don't want to tell them. Mm. And, and, and you should be allowed not to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because or why? Only, yeah, yeah. yeah but, but for now, I guess we need to keep on telling them. Mm. So yeah. Thank you. Thank cool. you, Mariana. And uh, finally, I'm going to come back to you, Malu. Um, I'm going to sort of start a little bit um, where uh, and sort of a little bit where I began, which is to sort of again with a reminder that we're we're here in the world court a space that has supported and celebrated international work for really a long time, not just from Latin America but from writers all around the world. Uh, that uh, I'm glad to say that's continuing and long may it continue because uh, it means that people like me get to do exciting projects like this. Um, outside of this building, it's not necessarily the same. And those of us who are translators will know that there can be resistance on the part of some of those decision makers to work in translation or to international uh, work to do with perceptions of what audiences might want or of what their programming uh, standards are, etc., etc. On top of that, sorry, I'm giving you the, <laughs> the, the, the tough job. <laughs> on top of that, of course, let, you know, the elephant in the room, we're still in a pandemic um, and theatre's in a, a tricky place at the moment. So with all of those things and in all of your experience as a programmer and producer who's been advocating for this sort of work throughout your career, how's it looking to you as we enter 2022? <laughs> well, <laughs> let me tell you, I know I've got the answer. <laughs> This is the answer you all came for. Um, well, <laughs> thanks, anyone. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there are, let's try to be positive. Um, one thing that happened a lot of, um, we were talking about this, and you mentioned a thing I wrote. Um, you know, we all went into loads of Zoom meetings and calls, and um, in at the beginning of the, of this uh, new scenario where we are living now. I, um, I was in a few conversations where like all of a sudden different people in the sector were like, oh my God, I now discovered all these, like these amazing creative from Ukraine. And I spent five months researching online to try to find the right person. And now I'm doing a partnership project with them and we're gonna do a show online. And I'm like, okay, great. And then someone else going like, yeah, I spent like, hours on this like um, website trying to find um, a writer somewhere in Ecuador and I was like do you know there are loads of creatives from other countries that actually live in London and so if you wanted to do an international project now you think you can do them because everything is digital but you could have always done them because there's <laughs> always a lot of people from everywhere in the world here in the UK so for me, it was a kind of like, like, why do we think that something is, you know, or you are either um, programming and selling shows that are British, or is something that we brought from somewhere else because it was really successful. So that's the like marketing pack that I put on to sell the tickets. But there's loads of different perspectives and point of views and stories that are here, and loads of different ways of doing things that already coexist with us. And also there's loads of audiences or potential audiences. Everyone can be an audience member if you're doing something that is talking to them or if you're trying to actually talk to them and not just like impose a show because you think, oh, this is uh, from um, the same continent that you come from, so you probably want to see it. Mm. Maybe not, you know? Maybe I don't want to see an Argentinian show, but maybe I want to see a show about like an, um, you know, woman almost in her 40s. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I have many identities, not only, <laughs> you're never gonna know, but not only, like, not only 
you know, it's not the only stamp that we have on our forehead that is like, this is, this is the target that I am, so these are the stories that I'm going to buy. And so I guess I'm saying two things at the same time. Like, literally, everyone is a potential audience. Don't, let's not just think that there's only one thing that sells, and let's not just think that because we're in the UK, it's only British stories. I mean, it's like if, as if any country in the world, any theater maker in the universe doing a Shakespeare would say, oh, we're only going to program that in the English season. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> no. So why do we only need to do these things in a certain way? And then I guess for me, it was really highlighting the value of the bridges that we as creatives that have migrated can, um, you know, the value that we have for all of our colleagues in the sector. And so when everyone discovered that we are locked in our houses, but we're actually connected because the world is at our fingertips. It was always there because there's always people from other countries around us, and there's always people with different perspectives and different realities around us. We just need to be open. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Thank you, Malu. Yeah, I think we we all we all ball we all skirt that no skirt that line walk that line between optimism, pessimism, and realism, and somewhere somewhere in the between is the way for us to go forward. I guess. Thank you, uh, all four of you. Um, I'd like now. Um, I don't know how much time we've got. Someone will give me a signal if we're okay. We've got five here, five, five maybe maybe ten uh, uh, minutes for uh, questions from the audience. Oh, great. Yes. Hello. Yeah, I'd like to ask if the actors. If you ever rehearsed in Spanish when you did this play? So, uh, for technical reasons, I need to repeat your question. Sorry. No, no, I need to repeat. It's, it's, a, it's a technical uh, issue. So, so the question, the te the, the, it's to do with my question. I, I heard you like you. It was beautifully clear. Um, uh, the, que the question was uh, for the actors: Did you ever rehearse in Spanish? This play, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, ever in your life. <laughs> no, okay. No, I'm just interested, was that a conscious decision or you never thought of doing that? It's just that? what it might bring out, seeing that everyone's... Uh, we had the original manuscript in yes. Spanish in the room at pretty much all times. Right, okay. Probably the director can speak more intelligently yeah, as to why that, that was done that way, but we, we were certainly all in touch and aware of the original throughout, okay. and had, you know, all of us had conversations, both with Pablo and Sam and William, during the process of rehearsing, where we were all challenging and thinking about how to find something that felt true to everyone, and, and you know, and that was a that was part of the joy of the process was that yeah. that was an absolutely live element of the work that we did. It was it was Pablo, William, it was a trifecta, so, you know, all of us. So yeah. um, no, we didn't ever read it in Spanish actually. Um, I don't know if that was ever a consideration, but um, yeah. I think I would just, uh, uh, it's not it, quite the same question you're asking, but sort of refer referring back to what Marianne was talking about, how because there were so many people who both spoke both English and Spanish yeah. in the room, there were certainly conversations that sort of happened in, sometimes in both languages at once, yeah. around the very questions that, that, that yeah. Pepe is asking. It's um, just that thing of um, reading it in the original language and all, all of you speaking Spanish, mm. there's always, it's a, there's a different feel. Mm. If you say it in that language and then you say it in English or whatever other language, there is a different, there is a different feel to it. Yes, definitely. But we knew that it was going to be English. Yeah. So just for the sake of kind of clarity, I think yeah. we, we decided to stick on to English for that sake. But like, yeah, as William was saying, like the conversations were constantly in between Spanish and English for the understanding of the text or like, commenting on it, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there are companies like um, the London Spanish Theatre Company that do bilingual productions where there's a Spanish language cast and an English language cast of the same play. Sometimes they're the same actors, sometimes they're not, sometimes they're a mixture. Um, and I think their process is to sort of have two parallel mm -hmm. rehearsal processes going on, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, no, in this case, we, 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 we stuck to English. Um, but thank you. Um, oh, yes, here in... How 
does that feel for you, William, working with a cast who could at any moment challenge the way you translate? <laughs> so the question was, as the translator, how did I cope with the, the terror of being in a room full of people whose Spanish is better than mine? <laughs> um, you know, in all seriousness, um, I think bef before... Um, before going into the sort of day one of the rehearsals, I, I think it's true to say I was quite anxious about it. Um, for, for the obvious reasons, right? There are people who, uh, a lot of people in the room who have a, a good reason to have more authority over what the original means than I do. But I have to say that um, it was not, my experience was not difficult at all. It was really enriching, actually, to have... Uh, so many people in the room who understood both languages. And I, I suspect it's to do with the fact that it's not... That, that, that this company, yes, understood the original perfectly, but also understands English and speaks English perfectly. So much like those of us who are translators knows what it means to be sort of on either side of those two... Actually, it's precisely what Mariana was talking about, that, that duality of lived experience. So the conversations we were having about, again, what does chocolate mean? Uh, and, and, and also other things more serious about political philosophy um, <laughs> were, were sort of, they, they were just, they were very enriching and, and, just, and very nuanced. We had a conversation about the phrase, como se, como se te ocurre? What, how, literally, how does it occur to you? Which, which means anything from something like, how can you think something so outrageous, how dare you? To, oh, don't worry about it. And we had this whole conversation about the point in which this line happens, about what, what the range of things that that one phrase can possibly mean. We went round in a big circle and we ended up where we'd started off. But um, oftentimes, um, I think as a translator, sometimes if you're in a room with people who perhaps don't understand the original language, you, you find yourself in this strange situation of having to sort of explain what the original means, but not in the original language. Whereas with this, I didn't have the problem with this because everyone... So, so actually, I found it extremely enriching, and I would do it again in a heartbeat, yeah. Any more questions? Oh. Oh, yes. Um, how does one get into um, translating theatre? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Top tips. Uh, I, I will... Uh, <laughs> find, your, find, find your network, find your community, find who you can. We've, we've talked about that in all sorts of ways. You might have a play that you've already discovered or a playwright that you've already discovered from whatever language that you think would be really interesting. And as we keep saying, London is full and, and growing <laughs> in terms of different spaces and places where you can test out your... Uh, translations where you've got people who can mentor you, where you've got like foreign affairs uh, companies that work across many uh, languages and do translation programs and think of translation as, as theatre practice as well. If it's Spanish, join out with the wings and bring your plays along to us or and Portuguese. we read them, or Portuguese, I beg your pardon, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Spanish or Portuguese, um, and some other languages spoken in the global Iberian world. But, um, uh, yeah, if that's if that's your area, then then do join out of the wings because then you find places where you where what the community is the thing you know and and you can start to uh, be mentored in the trade of, of translation. You can be reading the plays, etc. And and it's good. I mean, I think one of the great things about out of the wings is it has become a model for other languages, other theatre uh, languages as well, and that's been that's been a fantastic product of what we've been doing so I don't know what language you're thinking of but I'm pretty sure as Malou has said you'll find people in London you know there are already companies in, in Russian in Polish and Scandinavian countries in oh you name it it's here you can find it you know so I think part of it is the the search to find it find if you've already found it as uh, somebody you want to translate then find the space that somebody will actually say we're interested Show it to us, let's read it together. And going back to the first question William asked me about process, if you are thinking of translating something, don't suffer alone. Mm. <laughs> you have a community. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so it, you can share the things that you're translating 
And sometimes it's, it just takes, like what's the meet and read that we do at Out of the Wings, it just takes a, a day that you call out some mates and go like, can we just read through what I did mm. and see how it sounds and see what we do with it and maybe discuss, see what can change, see can, how it can progress with it. And that's how it starts. So don't suffer alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'd absolutely echo that. And I think, um, sort of to go back to the very first question about sort of what's changed in recent years, is that certainly I've, I've been translating plays for quite a while now. When I started out, um, that, that it, it wasn't that I was the only person doing it, but there weren't really places to go where you could talk about it. It was a, it was a bit disparate. It wasn't quite before the internet existed, but it was before Twitter existed and stuff. And that, whereas now, like, I think it really is true to say there is such a thing as a theatre translation community uh, that exists online in various spaces. Like, and so... Um, out of the Wings is a good place to start, even if you don't work with Spanish, Portuguese, or the related languages, because we've got our fingers in the... We're connected to all... And uh, I think once you find one place, you'll find it bridges out to lots of other places, and then you start having conversations and meeting people, and that's sort of just a great way to get started. Yeah. I think... Yeah, I think I'm getting the signal that we need to wrap up. But uh, thank you so much to all of you. Uh, for being here. Thanks for your questions, thanks for your attention and interest, and thank you especially to my wonderful palo, panel, Palu, uh, Malu, <laughs> Malu, Mariana, Catherine, and Almiro. Thank you so much.